Lead them beside still waters because you know how badly they need still waters. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. I, I love that. Then the, the, the sort of like showing or advocating to do something by showing how to do it um, that, that Hannah does is is a compelling, <laughs> a compelling uh, derailment from the cycle. Welcome back, welcome back everybody to No Script, an unscripted conversation about theater's best scripts. I'm Jacob Mann Christensen. And I am Jackson Nikolai. Welcome back, everybody. It's good to return to get to talk about theater. I was reflecting today as I was rereading the script for today. I was like, man, it's just great. I get to read script every week. <laughs> and what what other yeah, <laughs> I'm not it, sure that I would do it's it. It's a nice pattern. <laughs> it's a nice uh it's just nice to have something to do with the way that we can engage with theater without going to see theater, right? This, this sort of reading scripts, you know, today we're talking about a play that I think the vast majority of American theater loving folks should read because it's one of the classics by one of the classic playwrights. Uh, but it, it's tough to find a production of this play, I think. There's a fair amount technically required, and its co content is hard. So it's hard to see a production of this play. So reading it is probably the easiest way that you're going to access this material. But unless you have a sort of setup where you can all read something and talk about it together, it's like, what do you do? I mean, you read a play like this, and it's like, well, what do you do afterwards? Yeah. You've got yeah. to talk about it. It's <laughs> not. you got it. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the ways that just reading this play, let alone, I would imagine seeing this play done. Uh, but, but just, just in the reading of it, there's so much going on so much that the characters are processing out into the world so much that probably like nudges pieces of you as you read it. <laughs> um, and, and your own experience. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm excited to get to talk about it. We are kind of, it's, I was, I was ref also reflecting as we were about to jump into the conversation, we're, we're, we're talking about night of the iguana, the this week by Tennessee Williams, in case you didn't read the title and just push play because you like us or something or however you found us. Um, uh, and and I was reflecting as I was uh, thinking about jumping into this conversation, going from where we were last week with the drowsy chaperone into this play <laughs> is another one of our great no script 180s where we. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty big swing. <laughs> it's a big swing. <laughs> But an exciting one. It's no. exciting to be able to kind of move between those that that way. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's a privilege, as always, to have an opportunity to spend dedicated time in conversation about drama. And look, if you're not somebody that's set up with people around you who are prepared to read a script and talk about it with you uh outside of this podcast i'm part of a script club and we meet pretty regularly to talk about scripts that we've all read jointly functions like a book club you know if that's not something you have or you're not in school where you can talk about scripts in class hopefully this podcast kind of steps into that place for you uh it's hard to contribute you know while the conversation is going on of course because these are pre-recorded but you can send us an email on the back end contact us on social media we We'd love to have that conversation with you that way, or at least offer you the chance to do some processing of the play through these conversations that Jackson and I get to have every week. This is a this script's a great example of why that can be valuable. I think it would be difficult to read the Night of the Iguana and then not do some processing afterwards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> not do some processing <laughs> and not do some like, boy, I'm glad we don't think about things that way anymore. Um, yeah. So it's a things <laughs> um but yeah lots of uh big big uh especially uh, I, I imagine much of our conversation will rotate around a couple different scenes um and and the sort of like both philosophy but also worldview sorts of things and life experience sorts of things that are generated out of this play are really really uh provide for interesting conversation really deep stuff yeah, well, of course. And and also the the sheer scope of Tennessee Williams' theatrical imagination. He, he writes about in other plays, and I actually think he references it in this play, although I can't quite recall, 
uh, his his idea of like plastic theater or sculptural theater, this sort of total elements of visual, audio, movement, sound, lighting, all of these things coming together to make a sort of visceral experience that exists alongside as part of the human storytelling experience. And on the back of my copy of the script, which is the uh, Dramatist Acting Edition, uh, one of the quotes from a reviewer says, William's most mature work. I don't know about that one. I'm not sure I'm quite on board with that review. But what I do think is there's a New York Times quote that calls it, uh, that says this is Tennessee Williams at the top of his form. And I think there are a couple of plays that are representative of him at the top of his form. But this is certainly one in reference to that sculptural plastic theater that he talks about. The sort of total element of story, all of the tools of theater at his disposal in this script are, are I mean, it's, it's, it's the top of his craft j- in terms of that. Yeah. All of it blending together to create one synchronous experience across a lot of, a lot of the power that theater can, can have. I, I'm I mean, excited the, to get to jump. the rain scene, the use of the hammock. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. wow. It's, it's, it's incredible. I, I'm excited to kind of jump into it. There's lots of little, ping moments that uh, that i'm sure we'll name as we as we go through it um but uh before we jump into the conversation fully we've kind of already started it to some degree um we want to take a second to thank our patrons who are along for this conversation and all of our conversations um thank you all so much for being patrons of this show if you're a longtime listener of the show uh you know that we say this quite often we love getting to do the show as we mentioned at the top of the at the top of the show we love getting to read plays talk about plays with each other and extend that conversation out to to all of you out there in podcast land. And the show is not free. There's lots of things that uh, we have to pay for in association with the show. And the patrons at patreon.com slash no script podcast make that possible. Um, number of different tiers over there. Lowest one being just one dollar. Um, and with, at that level, you get access to patron only posts. You get access to the scripts that we'll be talking about early. Um, a number of different tiers over there. But for that one dollar amount, twelve dollars over the course of a year, you can really help out the show quite a bit over there. So thank you. Thank you to all of our patrons. Thank you to uh, all those who have already decided to go over to patreon.com slash no script podcast. And if you're looking for a way to kind of be a part of the no script community in a new way, it's a great way to do it. So head on over to patreon.com slash no script podcast, and we will see you over there. Absolutely. Big thank you to those of you who are supporting us. And now back to the script. Here we go. That's become sort of our like, uh, like PBS radio moment. It's, it's moved <laughs> right. a little bit away from like monster truck announcing and it's just sort of evolved <laughs> into like smooth jazz radio voice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we'll I have to go back and figure out uh, when that <laughs> happened, but it's like, it's like my Ira glass moment or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, the night of the iguana. Okay. So Tennessee Williams, right? We've done plays of his before. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, I suspect you have some idea of who Tennessee Williams is, or at least have heard the name. This is truly, truly one of the most influential people in American theater history. He is up there with your Arthur Millers, with your Eugene O'Neill's, with your Lynn Nottages, with your Susan Laurie Parks. I mean, this this is one of the major players. And we, we try to not do just major players scripts. So we, we kind of swing back and forth, but we like to come back to those scripts, to those playwrights that have been truly pillars of what has made American drama drama, the powerhouse that it is. And Tennessee Williams is one of those people. He was relatively unknown for the vast majority of his career. Um, and I'm not going to do a full introduction to Tennessee Williams. We do that the first time we talk about a playwright. It's not our first time for Tennessee. Uh, but just so you have a sense of where this comes in his career, uh, 1944 was when he sort of had his big first commercial success, The Glass Menagerie. Before that, he was pretty much obscure, pretty much unknown. Glass Menagerie comes out, and now he's a major player. Uh, 47 is when Streetcar comes out. 55 is when Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is produced. Um, so we're, we're in that zone because in 1948, so between Streetcar and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, Tennessee Williams apparently takes this trip to Mexico and he writes the short story, The Night of the Iguana, which will much later on become this play. But in 48, he writes the short story by the same title. 
Um, then 10 years later in 1959, the first stage version of his adaption of his own short story comes to fruition as a one act in 59. But in 61, the full script, the three act play that we know as the Night of the Iguana is uh, premiered on Broadway at the Royale Theater um, it, 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 1961 again. So this is uh, almost it's six years after Hot on, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. You know, we're talking about 17 years after the glass menagerie in terms of the scope of a career uh some real famous folks in that original broadway production you can look that up for yourself it was nominated for a tony award for best play uh margaret layton won a tony award for best actress in a drama as for her uh playing of hannah Three years later, because at this time, film adaptions of plays were much more uh, quickly produced, much more routine. So in 1964, the film version of The Night of the Iguana appears with Richard Berger, uh, Richard Burton, apologize, Ava Gardner, Deborah Kerr. Uh, Richard Burton's playing of the Reverend Shannon is kind of the hallmark playing of that role, uh, much like Marlon Brando as Stanley in the film adaption of Streetcar Named Desire. A lot of the reviews will compare whoever the actor playing Shannon is to Richard Burton's per, uh, performance. In 1967, a few years after that, the legendary director Joseph Hardy revives it on Broadway at the Circle in the Square. Uh, almost 20 years later, Circle in the Square revives it again in 1988. These are on Broadway. Then there's a London production in 1992 with the Royal National Theater. In 94, one of my favorite directors, the legendary Robert Falls, stages it at the Goodman that in Chicago, that production transfers to Broadway. Um, again, I'm not naming all the productions, just highlighting kind of how it's evolved for you. In 2005, at the Lyric Theater in London, there's a very famous production of The Night of the Iguana. Uh, Woody Harrelson actually played Shannon, you know, 17 years ago in that production. Oh, wow. Yeah, really. <laughs> cool. In 2006, Berkshire Theater Festival produces it. Ben Brantley has a great review of that production. In 2007, the Raven Theater in Chicago. 2017, the American Repertory Theater produces it. James Earl. Earl Jones is in that production as the grandfather character. 2018, the GAM Theater, which theater I don't know, but apparently it's in Warwick. Uh, 2019, however, this is the one that if you Google it, you're going to see a lot of advertising about because we've started to figure out marketing for theater. And so recent productions <laughs> are what tends to appear in our world now. Uh, 2019, the Noel Coward Theater in London produces what, by all accounts, was a uh, absolutely magnificent, soul-sputtering, uh, really leaning into the sculptural plastic drama of Tennessee Williams' imagination. The pictures are incredible. The videos are incredible. Uh, Clive Owen plays Shannon. And then Anna Gunn, who played Skyler in Breaking Bad, is Maxine in that production. So it, it's had a long life. It's had many hundreds more productions than the ones that I named, including many at regional houses, many at universities. I mean, this is one of the plays. You'll recognize the title, I would think. Um, and and it, it's, it continues to be alive to this day. Yeah, yeah, has has uh, quite the storied history, has quite the way that, uh, you know, different uh, actors can apply themselves to the roles, really deep roles. So I'm excited to get into the conversation around it. I'm going to give us uh, just a brief synopsis of this play. And I'm kind of do the going to do the broad strokes because there's lots of like tiny strokes going on in the play. And I'm, I'm just going to kind of give you the, the broad synopsis. Probably worth saying at the beginning here what we have been talking about um, uh, some of the dated elements of this play. This play um, is written set in 1940. Um, there's there's uh, quite a bit of racial stereotyping that happens in this play. Um, there's uh, uh, quite a few things uh, set in mostly in stage directions and things like that um, that are not appropriate um, and uh, are are uh, a difficult part of producing this play. So uh, if you've read the play, that, that that's uh, a thing to note. This play also deals with uh, the content of uh, the, the sexual life of the main character. And he is uh, a bit of um, a, a promiscuous fellow, and uh, he tends to like young women. Um, he's accused of uh, uh, raping a character in this play. Um, and so uh, that's going to Sta be statutory of... rape. And that's not like modern phrasing. That's the that's the term used in the play several times. Yep. Statutory rape. 
So that is uh, content in this play. If that doesn't sound like a character that you're wanting to spend time with, this is a, a character that is in this play and we'll be talking about. Um, so I wanted to say that up front and uh, kind of warn you going into the content of this play. That said, um, we're going to jump into the synopsis. This play is set in 1940, um, and it is set uh, in uh, in um, a, a bohemian hotel in Costa Verde. So uh, the the uh, the play kind of starts off there. We meet right away the proprietor of this place, who is Maxine. Um, and, uh, she is recently widowed. Uh, her husband, Fred died recently. He was a fisherman. We find this out pretty quickly in the opening scenes. Um, and she is kind of running this place on her own. Right away, we meet, uh, Shannon who kind of comes up. There's a loud blaring of horns, tour bus horns, and Shannon arrives, um, with this, uh, uh suitcase in hand covered in stickers, a well-traveled man. Um, and he's clearly friends with Maxine and friends with Fred, who he finds out pretty quickly has passed away. He has arrived with this tour bus full of... Of women who have uh, come to Costa Verde to have a vacation um, or a touring vacation through, I believe, Blake's Tours or something like that. Um, and uh, and uh, they've arrived and they've been kind of drug here by Shannon, who is kind of going through uh, a, a both a kind of mental hard moment and also he's uh, dealing with the consequences of some of his decision making. Namely, he has recently, in the last day or two, uh, slept with uh, the, a very young member of this party. She is 16 years old, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, she is uh, as a singer, and he kind of took her on a personal tour of the town, and they slept together, and her chaperone has caught them in the act and is accusing him of, of statutory rape, as we have said. Um, and so he's he's arrived at this hotel, um, kind of and pulled like the spark plugs basically out of the out of the bus and trapped them here. <laughs> to uh because this is a place that he knows is a safe place um he also uh is someone who is going through uh, a bit of a mental breakdown uh it's it's kind of uh, some of the language is a little bit uh dated in terms of what exactly he is going through um but some of it is substance abuse some of it is just kind of mental illness he's trying to kind of survive maybe maybe a depressive swing or a manic swing it's it's kind of difficult to nail down exactly what he's going through but he knows that he can get to if he can get to this place he's been here before when this has happened and he thinks that Fred and Maxine can help him in this moment. The the language used in the script is that he's he's cracking up. You know, it sounds like the 60s of course and it right. it it's referenced a number of times in the script that, you know, every so often he has these episodes where he cracks up and he goes to this resort in Mexico because he knows Maxine and of course he knew Fred then they'll take care of him through this episode. And in the past, he's been institutionalized at a local mental hospital for whatever this kind of mental health episode is. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, he arrives here again with this busload of people who are not wanting to be here. So much of the first act is this busload of people coming up the hill trying to get him to leave. Um, the, the, the character who he ends up uh, fighting with a lot is Miss Flois who is uh, the uh, chaperone of Charlotte, who is the 16-year-old uh, singer who is on the trip. Um, and she's up there. She's trying to get him to leave. She's trying to... The, the bus of people is, like, getting off of the bus and trying to figure... It's very hot here, so they're, like, baking on the bus, essentially. The bus driver, Hank, comes up, tries to get him to leave, and he refuses. He, he, he has the keys, he has the spark plugs, and he's not letting him go. Um, so, uh, he's, he's all through this scene kind of processing with Maxine what has happened over these last couple days and over these last couple years, really, we find out quite a bit about Shannon in this first scene. We find out that he was, uh, trained as a doctorate of ministry of some sort, that he was a priest in the church, that, uh, he was, he served in that role for about a year and has since not been in the church, um, and uh, he's been kind of traveling the world as this tour guide, as a reverend tour guide, essentially, and kind of taking people around to different areas and giving tours with different touring agencies. The other uh, big entry into this scene is the entry of Hannah and her grandpa, Nono. Um, they emerge into the scene. She is kind of pushing Nono up the hill in a wheelchair. She arrives asking to try to stay there. Um, she is uh, kind of in her, like, 30s, 40s, somewhere in that range of age, late 30s, early 40s, and then Nono is a 97-year-old 
poet um, who uh, has arrived here 97 years young, as is often said in the script. Um, and uh, he's arrived here to try to write his last poem, essentially. And they've been traveling all over the region trying to find a place for him to do that. Um, what becomes pretty clear pretty quickly is they're basically traveling artists pretty down on their luck. Um, they have no money left. She uh, is trying to negotiate staying here. She asks, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, Shannon asks, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. Um, Hannah asks Shannon to try to help her get Maxine to let her stay at this, uh, at this uh, resort of hers. And eventually she talks her way into staying there for one night, basically on the on the fact that Nono is so frail uh, that to kick to kick him out is going to be basically impossible. So Maxine puts them in a storm coming too. it's like big storms coming off big storms coming tonight. Yeah. So that so uh, Maxine basically takes pity on them, puts them in the room. Um, all of this is kind of swirling around for most of Act 1. We arrive at Act 2, kind of the evening after that. Um, the busload of people has kind of found something to do. Um, they're off uh, uh, on a glass-bottom boat tour looking at uh, sub submarine animals um, as the storm is blowing in. Um, and then Hannah, we pick up the scene with Hannah and Maxine. Hannah's still negotiating, trying to figure out some way to get there to stay longer, trying to find some way to get uh, her and Nono a place to stay for a long time so that he can write his poem. This this act uh, kind of centers quite a bit on conversation between Shannon and Hannah. Um, we learn a lot more about how Shannon and Nono have traveled all over the place. Nono recites some of his poetry, um, and we learn a little bit more about uh, the different stories that they have trying to make money as traveling artists all over the world. We also learn a little bit more about Shannon um, and about how uh, he has uh, been long time, uh, long time, not, uh, he, he resists the term defrocked member of the church, though that is what he is. Um, he, uh, right away at the start of his time as a priest, had uh, an affair with a, uh, a parishioner and uh, then preached a pretty vitriolic sermon against the congregants who knew about this affair and uh, was pretty much right away sent away from his role in the church. And has since been wandering as a tour guide for much of his his life. Um, we also learn uh, more about uh, the the way that uh, that Hannah has been traveling with No No. All of this is happening uh, while the storm is building. More and more is 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 coming around. There's also uh, the I, I must mention because it's the title of the play. Um, uh, Maxine uh, has uh, these people uh, at, at the at the resort with her. They are uh, f folks that she has to help run the place, but she also like is kind of like has a concubine relationship with them. At least that's what Shannon <laughs> accuses her of at one point. They're all sleeping together. Um, and uh, they, at some point, have captured this iguana. And uh, they have uh, kind of tied it up under the porch of the resort. And it's kind of making scuffling noises throughout much of the action of the play. Storm arrives, big storm, uh, and uh, the the uh, kind of big uh, uh, technical aspect of the play is the portrayal of the storm, and amidst all of the conversation that Shannon and Hannah have been having, a um, uh, uh, big theatrical moment happens, and we end the act, intermission, we're into act three. Act three, oh, uh, one other part that I must mention in act two before we move on is there is a confrontation between Shannon and Charlotte. Partway through the conversation with Shannon and Hannah, Charlotte arrives, says, we, like, we have to continue our, our relationship in some way, and Shannon says, no, I'm really not emotionally available at all. Um, there's no way that we can be together, um, and that kind of breaks Charlotte's heart. Eventually, her chaperone comes and grabs her and takes her away. Which leads us into Act 3, where we start the act by Shannon, who has kind of attested to his love for God as this, like, kind of creation, uh, expressing God's self through creation uh, quite a bit. And so the storm kind of prompts Shannon to write this letter to his bishop, confessing again that he wants to come back to the church. Um, however, pretty much right away, uh, it's clear that Mrs. or Miss Fellows has been calling the tour agency, who has sent someone else to kind of bring this whole tour bus away from Shannon um, and rescue them from him, essentially. Um, who they, they arrive, there's this big confrontation where he tries to talk his way out of it, try to get severance, tries to hold on to the tour, basically manically tries to hang on to the fragile order that he has established for himself in this life, but it is taken away from him, and the whole tour bus leaves. This leads him to a pretty substantial moment, um, a, a break. He has a big kind of panic moment. He says that he's going to basically go down to the ocean and swim his way to China, and... Um, 
which he has stopped doing uh, by by Hannah, who calls out to Maxine, who grabs him and brings with the, with the help of some of the others there and brings him back to the hammock that is on the veranda there and like ties him into the hammock. Big long scene happens with him tied into the hammock. Um, he's left there. Uh, some ultimatums are given by Maxine, who says that she's going to call the insane asylum again, basically, and have him checked into there. Um you have Hannah, who uh, goes on a pretty prolonged effort to try to bring him back to sanity. She brings out tea. She tries to talk him through some things. They have a long conversation. A good chunk of the play is this conversation that they have um, back and forth about uh, both the way that he tends to view the world as this sort of like penance that he's paying as a result of his relationship with God and perhaps his relationship with his mother and also Hannah's way of viewing the world, which is kind of this commitment to relationship to her grandfather, even though uh, he's his kind of declining health is is causing her to wonder, well, maybe there's an end to this insight. The play kind of wraps up. I'm not going to go into the fine parts of that um, because it's going to be a good chunk of the content of our conversation, I'm guessing, because um, uh, eventually he gets up. She manages to calm him down. Um, there is a moment of tension between them. You kind of wonder whether or not they uh, like like sexual tension, whether or not they're going to get together at all. Um, uh, but it, it's uh, throughout the play. There's been this through line of Maxine kind of coming on pretty hard to Shannon. And Hannah notices this. Hannah um, uh, 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 kind of says, you, you need to deal with that and I'm not going to get in between the two of you, which is how it eventually ends. Hannah uh, is given a gift by Shannon of uh, his cross. He carries this cross that he has recently or that he has pawned away in the past that he has recently got uh, redeemed from the pawn shop. He gives it to her so that she is maybe able to pay her fare back to the States. It's a, a gold cross with an amethyst in the center of it. Pretty important prop. I'm excited to talk about that just a little bit. Um, and then uh, Shannon is left with Maxine who basically says, what if you stayed here and helped me run the place? You I'll take care of, I'll take care of all the middle-aged businessmen that come here. You take care of all of their wives and we'll like try to run this hotel together. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of close to the, the last couple lines of the play. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, they they kind of head off for, for a swim, and uh, you uh, have this final scene where um, finally Nono has come up with his last poem. He's He's been writing it all by memory because he can't see, he can't really hear all that well, um, and he uh, kind of speaks out this poem. Hannah writes it down. She says she's going to send it to the publisher, and the kind of last moment of the play is her... Um, praying, trying to figure out what comes next, and no, no, passing away. Um, so you have this kind of final moment of them on the stage together, him having given his last uh, last rendition of his poetry, and uh, her kind of wondering what comes next as a result of that. Yeah, just to, to credit Tennessee Williams just a hair, the, him f reciting the final poem that he's created doesn't come like seconds before his death. It's a, it's right. a couple of pages earlier. There's some action that between the poem and his death is the whole scene where Maxine convinces Shannon to stay and Shannon gives Hannah the crucifix. So the order there is not, it's not quite so tied together, but there right. is very much like a no, no finishes his poem <laughs> and then shortly thereafter dies. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Admittedly. Um, Michael Billington, who's a theater reviewer for The Guardian, he describes, I loved his phrasing, he describes this play as a languorous hymn to human endurance. Um, hmm. and, and it's the endurance that I think is kind of interesting because everything in this play, and, and maybe everything is strong, but a lot of the major sweeps of this play have happened before. And here's yeah. what I mean by this. Shannon comes to this resort to have these mental breakdowns all the time, apparently. It's pretty routine. That's sort of one sort of repetition that is the plot of this play. Apparently, he considers going back to the priesthood very regularly, to the point where Maxine says, if you're wearing your cross, that means you must be thinking about doing this again. So there's that aspect of it. Um, Hannah and her grandfather go to hotels and sell their trade, their skills as artists for their room and board. This is something that they do all the time. This is their life. It's a repetition over and over again. The, uh, the folks that live at this resort, Maxine and all of the workers, catch iguanas, tie them up under the porch, feed them until they're eventually fat enough to eat, 
all the time. This is a regular, repetitive thing that happens, uh, you know, over and over again. This is a play about things that happen to these people, not just one time, the unique plot of this play, but many times. Um, and, and the convergence of them kind of coming together changes the outcome somewhat. And that seemed, if I were to describe the plot of this play, I'd sort of describe it circularly with when the circles overlap, sort of Venn diagram overlapping, that's when you get the real plot. And the plot is how do these cycles of, of life, of the suffering of life, but also the goodness of life, these cycles that their characters seem trapped in, how do they change when they're entwined? And when something uh, uh, completely, completely new arrives into that si that circle, um, so so the the entwining of it brings in things that are that are completely new. So you have Shannon, or I'm sorry, uh, I can't, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this consistently. Hannah arriving <laughs> into Shannon's life <laughs> um, as this kind of really really big uh, derail. She has this question at one point. He's like, "Why are you helping me? Why are you helping? Me? Stop it! Let me out of this." hammock that i'm tied up in and she has this question where she says when was the last time someone just honestly wanted to help you um which i think is a little bit uh, a little there, there's there's cause to maybe suspect a little bit hannah's intentions but not really um there's there's uh i think she like kind of genuinely sees a soul that is in need of her help which is a big change for for uh for shannon you also have in their story I'm, I'm curious so actually can we pause there for a second because i'm curious what you mean by that when you say you suspect her attention her intentions. well i i'm i'm i i, I have like this sort of half-baked wondering about uh about uh hannah um because she has this this uh story about all of these times that she has had kind of odd odd interactions with people on her travels and coming out of it, um, uh, kind of rolling with the punches and coming out ahead as a result of it. Um, and that kind of happens for Hannah in the course of this interaction. She kind of rolls uh, with the punches a little bit, finds this person who is in, um, in, in need of help and does help him. And then ultimately, at the end of the play, she receives this this cross with an amethyst in it that kind of enables her to change what is going to happen next. Um, so, so it is this sort of like it's, I, I just I just, I have like wonderings and questions around around how Hannah shows up in the world and like how she how um uh, um how she, how genuine she is all the time and in, in the ways that she is kind of interacting with with the people that cross her path. Interesting. Yeah, I, I Shannon finds in Hannah like a kinship because late in the play you you learn and again the language around this is from the 60s and it's it's it, I think it's intentionally obscure in the play anyway and then you complicate the the sort of uh, cultural gap but um Hannah describes that at some point when she was younger she experienced some sort of mental illness episode as well we're never yeah. really sure much more than that, but it, it kind of creates this kinship between Shannon and Hannah. And I, and I wonder, one of the really beautiful moments in the play is this description in, this is getting very much towards the end of the play in the extended scene between Shannon and Hannah when he's tied up in the hammock and then eventually when he gets free, um, she describes sort of the relationship that she has with her grandfather and she uses the word home. Um, she, she says, we make a home for each other. My grandfather and I, Shannon then kind of interrupts and, 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 uh, uh, challenges her he says a home is a place you stay in it's stationary right he's got a different kind of definition of home he's a traveler so he's thinking about home as like stability uh being able to be protected from having to move around but hannah says i don't mean that kind of home i mean the kind that two people build between them in which they can well nest rest live in emotionally speaking Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that is one of the differences. I mean, there's obviously there's many differences between Shannon and Hannah, but in the way that their lives have sort of played out with whatever kind of mental illness difficulties are underneath their reality, um, 
she, uh, Hannah has a an everlasting companion, and, and not in the sense that he will be there forever, because of course he dies at the end of the play, but in the sense that through all of this, she's had this companion with her. Her parents died when she was very young. Her grandfather has basically raised her from that point on, and now they travel the world together. They've made their living together. She's in her, I think it's early 40s, um, and has had this steadfast companion um, and their roles have changed, right? Of course, he raised her when she was young, and now she's taking care of him in his old age. There is this, she describes it as a home created between them. And I think when she, when, when Hannah, I just did it, when Hannah <laughs> has this, rec, when she describes what this is for her and this sort of resting, nesting, emotional stability that she's created with her grandfather, you really get the sense of lack in Shannon's life. I mean, Shannon has nothing to that effect near him at all. Now, some of that is his own doing, admittedly. But nevertheless, when you see these two characters in this moment at the end of the play, Hannah has something that Shannon does not. Yeah, definitely. This sort of like, this sort of uh, belonging that she has um, in the, you, you can see it all uh, every time, like something happens with Nono. Like there's this, there's this kind of like almost terrifying moment when Nono is left on stage alone for a little while. Hannah goes off to do something off stage and he's trying to communicate and, and uh, the, and kind of, he wakes up and starts trying to recite this poem. He's, he's losing his memory. can't quite get it down. Um, and he's, he takes two different runs at it. And the rest of the characters on stage are like, uh, how do we, how do we help you in this? And then finally Hannah returns turns to the stage and uh and can recite the rest of the poem for him and you really get this sort of like uh the way that they have existed for such a long time this almost like uh mutual care that they all that they show for each other in 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 the way that especially hannah's care for no no as she runs in and kind of helps him uh function into this and and recall the parts of himself that he is losing yeah well and and shannon i think has he he seems to have a desire for that uh, without the ability, and again, some of it because of his own mistakes, but he does not have the ability to grab at it. And it it leaves him a sort of a terribly lonely and, and pitiable character. Uh, ben Brantley, who's a reviewer for the New York Times that you may know, um, he was he's re, he's uh, reviewing a specific production, of course. But he describes how a particular actor, somebody named Dillahunt, I don't have the first name, plays Shannon. This is now quoting with uh, an epicene edge, a delicacy and yielding sensuality. Uh, he brings to mind the Southern gentleman. He wears the perpetually affronted look of someone for whom the contemporary world is too coarse and too cruel to be endured. And now the important part. Listen to the connection that he makes here, which I think is fascinating. It makes life all the tougher that he finds coarseness and cruelty within himself. He wears his crucifix and clerical collar as if they scorched his skin. Now, whom does this description remind you of if you change the sex and take away the religious accoutrements? Maybe Blanche Dubois of a street card name desire. Mr. Dillahunt reminds us that William's doomed, self-lacerating seekers of beauty and mercy weren't necessarily women. I find that a fascinating uh, uh, analysis by Ben Branley, because if you start with the idea, how are Blanche and Shannon related? Boy, you find a lot there. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. The kind of dreamer, the sort of like world that they're like wishing the world was different than it is. Um, kind of constantly wandering around, relying on the kindness of strangers. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that is a fascinating take for sure. And 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 then there are like some very practical material stuff too. Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire has that very uncomfortable moment where she describes sleeping with all these young men, and then like the young newspaper boy, the teenage, or he maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, he's selling something, comes in, and she has those lines where she's like, "You're so young, so so right." And Shannon yep. has this this 
terrible thing that he does where he sleeps with teenagers. I mean, so there's that comparison. Um, and you pointed out the sort of fantasy reality point. Shannon has like an articulated life philosophy about the two diff the difference between the fantastical life and the real the real life and the two planes that he lives on. And he lives in the fantasy world, and so it makes it hard to endure reality. And that like is that not Blanche's thing? Yeah. Like she covers the shade so that it can look beautiful she has all these fantastic totally non-real descriptions of herself and her life i mean wow i love that articulation of the connection between those two tennessee williams characters i mean uh, and also i mean this isn't this is kind of uh generally applied across many tennessee williams plays but the the, the heat as this element yes. of, of well, the something. environment yeah, yeah, the environment that like kind of pressure cooks essentially. Um, uh, a lot of different. A, it it makes necessary a lot of choices in the play. Like even down to the the uh, the tour bus full of people um, needing to confront um, rather than go away. It's because they're baking in the midday heat <laughs> in this bus. Um, this so so the kind of and, and the push of the storm, nature and environment as a uh, as a as a. Um, impetus for action is is a common thread across Williams' plays. Right, and and the way in which um, the environmental world again that sort of uh, sculptural plastic drama that he describes the the place of the play all of the tools in creating the world of the play are not separate from the experience of the play. They are very much part of it. They, in fact, are the play in the same way that the human stories and the dialogues are. The oppressive heat of the jungle, the rain, again, that beautiful rain scene where Shannon comes out to sort of confront God and he washes his hands in the middle of this rainstorm. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't recall exactly, but I think he maybe is even wearing pieces of his clerical garb in this moment, washing his hands, challenging God in the rainstorm. In the same way that the French Quarter, the people yelling for tamales on the corner, the neighbors who sort of turn a blind eye to the domestic abuse, right? The environment of streetcar is not separate from the story. It is the story in the same way that Blanche Dubois and Stanley and Stella are. Mm hmm. Interestingly, the the also the kind of use, I think there's an interesting riff on the use of uh, uh, alcohol in this play um, that that uh, is kind of switched, uh, I think, from my expectation of it, at least there. You know, I kept waiting for a moment when someone drinks enough <laughs> to, like, remove inhibitions, as was, you know, as is kind of to commonly. Spill the beans. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's resisted consistently throughout this play. Um, uh, especially from Shannon, who will sometimes take alcohol from someone and throw it off the side of the stage, um, which is kind of just a, a, an interesting, like, um, you kind of um, get the sense that that is another of the pieces of his character that is that he's trying to resist or figure out or move against. He moves towards the there's a, a prominent alcohol cart there all the time as as kind of this um impending uh threat sort of thing like at any moment he could go over and kind of break and go have another drink or something like that and yet consistently he resists it and doesn't definitely yeah he he is literally i mean he's sober in the very first scene of the play maxine says boy you look terrible when did you fall off the wagon and he says no 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 i'm still on the wagon i'm still sober i just am sick he's he's sick with fever for the you know i guess the whole play takes place in 24 hours so he's delirious with fever the whole time but maxine i think in part due to her desire to sort of draw him in as a companion for her in this resort is kind of consistently through the play trying to get him to drink um, and there's a great confrontation scene uh, when they're all set up for their meal where the drink cart, Shannon and Maxine sort of fight to push and pull over the drink cart. Um, you'll see pictures of that if you look up this play. It's one of the big physical action moments of the play. It, th there's some interesting and uh, we, we talked at the start of this uh, uh, podcast about 
how all the elements uh, that theater can uh, bring to bear on storytelling are brought to bear. It's Tennessee Williams using all of them to to a great effect. I don't know about all of them. That's that's a that's a that's a big statement. A lot of them. It's a lot of the theatricality in this play, and the physical action element of it is a really interesting one because there's a lot of physicality in this play for how talky it is. Um, there's 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 the fight over the cart. There's this this family. I, I don't I don't remember if I actually talked about them in my synopsis, but there's this family of Germans there. It's 1940. There's they're like, you know, listening to Nazi propaganda there and they're like marching around stage the whole time. There's a lot of this sort of like physicality going on, disrupting what's happening uh, in this sort of mental um, uh, uh, gymnastics that's happening in the play. No, yeah, definitely. And, and there's some really heartbreaking moments of physicality, like the moment where the it's a little unclear to me how Hank is related to the tour. Hank is a very side character. I think he only appears on stage twice. He's like somehow involved in Shannon's tour. He's an yeah. assistant or, or maybe the driver, he's the bus maybe. driver, but, yeah, but Shannon yeah. has the keys to the bus himself. Regardless, uh, the the other guy comes to take over the tour and, and Shannon is hiding the key in his pocket. Um, and so Hank and the guy basically physically restrain Shannon, pin him and st- and swipe the key out of his pocket. And it's just sort of a heartbreaking moment of helplessness from Shannon as he's sort of scrambling to hold on to. I think in your synopsis, you described it as this sort of control that he has over this tour and the tour bus. But it's fascinating that the biggest, most metaphoric uh, moment of physical action in the play is off stage, right? The freeing of the iguana. Now I get it, yeah. right? Tennessee Williams was like, look, I can't, I can't ask them to put an iguana on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's gotta be off stage action. So I, I, I mean, I'm with you, Tennessee. I get it. You can't, you can't put an iguana on stage, All right. but All right. it's such a, a highly symbolic, important moment. It's like, it seems to be, to some degree, the big decision that Shannon makes at the end of the play, or one of them, is to march under the porch and free this iguana that's been tied up. They keep saying the iguana's at the end of its rope. And, of course, it's a metaphor. It's a very specific, I think actually a little obvious metaphor for the grandpa. <laughs> and then it's just a hair more subtle metaphor for Hannah and Maxine and Shannon, all three of them sort of trapped in their own cycles of life. Um, and, and it's, it's interesting that that one is off stage for all the other crucial physical moments on stage. Def- definitely. Especially, I mean, I think par- it's partially helped by the kind of metaphoric one that happened just before because, um, uh, Shannon has been tied up in the hammock right before it. And you have this sort of interesting riff on that one in that, he could have gotten out the whole time. He like at, at, at some point, like they, they think they've kind of tied him up in it, but at some point he sits up and like unties himself and gets up once he's kind of done with the, the, uh, the essentially the ruse that he's putting on that. This is a painful constricting moment for him. Not a ruse. Um, he's, he's, he's going through something and he's, 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 uh, he's at least partially, uh, trying to, uh, say that it's claustrophobic for him, you need to free me, etc. But at some point, he just gets up and lets himself out. Which is interesting, then, that he then goes and is the agent who frees the iguana um, after having uh, overcome that own, his kind of own spot of tied up, restricted. Um, I don't know if he's necessarily overcome it, but he's certainly kind of gotten past that moment in some degree and enabled him to kind of go free another to take pity on this iguana and loose it from beneath the stage. Yeah, it, there's all this interesting conversation as Hannah is trying to convince Shannon to go free the iguana. Uh, Shannon says, you know, something to the effect of like, OK, I'm going to go play God tonight. He says, we'll play God tonight like kids play house with old broken crates and boxes, all right? Shannon is going to go down there with his machete and cut the damn lizard loose so it can run back to its bushes because God won't do it, and we are going to play God here. Um, And so... I think when you start to layer some of these observations together, like I love that you point out that Shannon is only able to go cut the iguana free because he freed himself. So he did something and his, he's, 
this big crisis of faith that he's in and identity. He did something that God wouldn't do for him in freeing himself, not just, of course, from the, the hammock, but all this other, the, the ropes of the hammock representing, I don't know if it's his alcoholism or his, his, his constant sleeping with all these young women or uh, his, his, his not being the person he wants to be, all these things that bind him. He frees himself and then he's able to play God for, he describes later, another one of God creatures. He says, I cut loose one of God's creatures at the end of his rope. Um, and it, it, you start to, I, I'm, I truly, I, I, I just tried to start a sentence, but I didn't know how to end it. I mean, I, I don't know what to make of. <laughs> if there's something there, but like it's ephemeral and yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Actually, I think one of the more interesting, deep descriptions of, of this play observations perhaps by Tennessee Williams is Shannon describes the way he thinks about God now as an incomplete sentence. And that's, that comes up several times in the play and then it's applied to other things. And, you know, what, what could have been between Hannah and Shannon is an incomplete sentence. Um, and so this sort of incomplete sentence of this play I think is fascinating. I mean, I, I yeah. don't think we have any real idea what is going to become of these characters when the play mm-hmm. ends. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Maxine and, and Shannon go off for a swim and you kind of think that he's sort of warmed up to the idea of maybe staying here to some degree. But again, like just a couple pages before Hannah has said it's nighttime and all sorts of things feel possible at night. But when the morning comes, this is all going to look a lot different. Um, so, so you have, you have that as the knowledge, you also have the knowledge that, uh, Hannah's world has substantially changed in the last moments of the play. Uh, Nono has said his last poem and has passed away. So there's lots of questions as to what the morning is going to bring for all of these characters. And taking into account too, because I, I totally agree that I don't know that I, it seems to imply that he's going to stay the night at the resort, but I don't know that right. he stays after that. And of course you're right. Hannah doesn't know what she's going to do now that her grandfather has died earlier in the play. in one of their first conversations, this is what Hannah says about Shannon. I have a strong feeling you will go back to the church with this evidence you've been collecting, but when you do, and it's a black Sunday morning, look out over the congregation. I'm going to skip some. She says to look out over the congregation. I think you will throw away the violent, furious sermon. You'll toss it off the channel and talk about, maybe talk about nothing. And then what I think is truly one of the beautiful moments of the play, she says that he should lead them beside still waters because you know how badly they need still waters, Mr. Shannon. I don't know if that early prediction is what is going to come to fruition for Shannon after the end of this play, but some of what he learns perhaps or how he changes in the play is the way that Hannah, and it doesn't come to fruit, the, the romantic sexual tension that may be there at different points, Maxine certainly thinks it is, never comes to fruition. So this is not a love story. This is a story about a guy at the end of his rope, I mean, sick to death nearly, uh, in all of this moral pain for the terrible decisions he's made, uh, trying to stay sober, having a mental illness breakdown, who comes and needs still waters. And he comes to this resort a lot when he has these moments, but he gets thrown in these mental institutions that never changes. But this time, I think that Hannah does for him in the play what she su- suggests that he needs to go back and do for other people. Lead them beside still waters because you know how badly they need still waters. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. I love that. And the, the, the sort of like showing or advocating to do something by showing how to do it um, that, that Hannah does is is a compelling <laughs> a compelling uh, derailment from the cycle that that Shannon has been going through. Well, yeah, we're we're close to out of time on this one. Yeah, it's, we're about it's a there. Fantastic. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much, so many different facets to go into. So many great, like, just kind of comedic fighting that happens throughout the play that, of course, we couldn't really zoom in on and capture in the form of talking about it on a podcast. Um, but uh, we would love to keep chatting about this play. We don't have to stop the conversation here. We'd love to keep chatting about it with you, all of you. If you've read this play, seen this play, been in this play, or just, uh, you know, at whatever time you have uh, participated in the life of this play and are looking for someone who else who has read it and you want to chat 
with us about it. We'd love to be those folks for you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the username at NoScriptPodcast. We also have a Gmail, NoScriptPodcast at gmail.com. Find us on any of those platforms. We'd love to keep talking about Night of the Iguana with you. Absolutely. If you've liked this conversation or any of our other conversations, there's quite a few of them out now. You can recommend this podcast to your family and friends. It'd be a huge help to us. They can find us on Podbean, on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify. I think we're on SoundCloud. We're on a bunch of other places you can find podcasts, including YouTube. Um, so check us out in all of those places. If you have somebody that has a hard time, you know, uh, using specific apps to find stuff, if they just got Facebook, they can like us on Facebook. And every Monday, a link to the new episode appears on our Facebook page. You should be able to click and play from there. We're coming at you next week with another one of theater's best scripts. But until then, I am Jackson Nikolai. I am Jacob Mann Christensen. Thanks for joining us for No Script the Podcast.